Before we get started, there's a URL there, tinyurl.com, downy23goat, that will get you the slides for this talk. And then later on, there are some links that will get you to some notebooks that contain some code and some additional resources at the end. So I'm Alan Downey. I'm a staff producer at Brilliant, working on online lessons related to programming and data science. Before that, I was a professor at Olin College, just outside of Boston, which is a new undergraduate engineering college. And I worked on a number of books related to programming and data science, including a new book, which is called Probably Overthinking It, which is being released today. This is the official launch day. So happy launch day, everybody. And what I'm presenting today is based on chapter four, which is also called Extremes, Outliers, and Goats. So to get started, I want to show a video here of the Freeze, who is the mascot of the Atlanta Braves, an American baseball team. Favorite promotion on the road here, the Freeze Rock. A fan gets a head start, and then the Freeze tries to catch him. I mean, that's a significant head start. Yeah, no, no kidding. I didn't think he had a chance, but he just fetched this guy. Closing speed. This is instead of the mascot race? I love it. This guy can fly. Looks like a young Damon Nelson. And then down it goes. You lose, sir. Man, you weren't even breathing heavy. Favorite promotion. So what we just saw there is evidence that fast runners are much faster than ordinary runners in a way that I think we don't always appreciate. But that race between a pretty good runner and someone who was a competitive runner in college shows you how much faster fast runners really are. And it turns out that we see the same phenomenon with chess players who are much better than average players. And even among the most elite performers, there's often a GOAT, greatest of all time. And in basketball, it's Michael Jordan. In tennis, it's Serena Williams. In hockey, it's Wayne Gretzky. And one thing I want to point out here, looking at the total points scored in a career here, is the difference between number one and numbers two, three, and four. So two, three, and four scored 1,800, 1,800, 1,900 points in their careers. Wayne Gretzky scored almost 2,900, almost 1,000 more points than the second second runner up on this list. So that's an example where the greatest of all time is substantially better even than other elite performers. And this happens not just in athletics, but in a lot of fields, chess, music, programming. I'm going to claim that any field that requires this kind of talent, training, opportunity, and persistence, we're going to see these kinds of outliers. And I'll mention Malcolm Gladwell's book, also called Outliers, that raises some of these points. So I'm going to try to explain why this is happening. And my claim is that the distribution of these capabilities does not follow the Gaussian distribution that we have some intuition for. It follows a log normal distribution that violates those intuitions in some ways. And to ask why one more time, I'm going to suggest two data generating processes that might explain why we see these log normal distributions. I'm going to call them proportional gain and a weakest link process. So I'm going to start with proportional gain, and I'll use as my example the distributions of height and weight. So this is Robert Wadlow. He was 272 centimeters tall, which is about 60% taller than average. So that's the tallest person that ever lived is about 60% taller than average. The heaviest person reliably measured was 653 kilograms, which is almost 700 percent, 700 percent heavier than average. So about eight times the average weight. That discrepancy suggests that these distributions of height and weight are qualitatively different. And I'm going to show why that might be the case. But first, we need some data. I'm going to use the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, which is data collected by the CDC. 
It includes self-reported height and weight of about 200,000 men and women in the United States. So we're going to look at some CDFs, some cumulative distribution functions. I'm going to assume that people are familiar with CDFs, but just as a reminder, if we plot the PDF, the probability density function of a Gaussian, what we see on the left is the classic bell curve. And if we integrate that, or if we add up those cumulative probabilities, we get the cumulative distribution function on the right, which is going to look like this sigmoid. So that's what we're going to use to compare the data sets that we're looking at with these Gaussian and log normal models. So here's a first example. This is the distribution of adult height in the BRFSS for a female and male respondents. And the uh, orange and blue curves here show the distribution of the data. And the gray line that you can just barely see is a Gaussian model. What this allows us to, to judge is how well the model fits the data. And we can see that it fits pretty well with one possible discrepancy here between male respondents uh, right around 5'11 or 6 feet, and remembering that these are self-reported heights, suggests that we have a shortage of people who are 5'11 and a slight excess of people who are 6 feet tall. But despite discrepancies like that, we could conclude that the distribution of height looks like a Gaussian distribution, as contrasted with the distribution of weight. So these are the same respondents, again, male and female respondents in the BRFSS. This is weight on a linear scale. And now we can see that those Gaussian models deviate from the data in a number of places. And I've added these black crosses uh, at the top of the distribution that show the expected heaviest person in a data set this size if the distribution is Gaussian. And we can see that the heaviest people in the data set are substantially heavier than what we would expect if it were Gaussian. On the flip side, if we now take those weights and put them on a log scale, we see, first of all, that there are now Gaussian models that fit the data very well. And if we look at those crosses up in the upper right hand corner, it looks like the heaviest people are a little bit heavier than we would expect in a data set this size, but not by as much. So we could conclude that the distribution of weight is log normal, although I do want to remind us that what that always means is that the distribution is well modeled by a Gaussian or a log normal distribution. Nothing in the real world ever follows these mathematically perfect models perfectly. All right, so where do these distributions come from? Fundamentally, the central limit theorem is the explanation. If you add up a bunch of random factors, the sum converges to a Gaussian. And mathematically, that is true, that is provably true, if all of those factors come from identical distributions with finite moments, they are uncorrelated with each other, you have an infinite sample size, and if the operation that you're performing is literally a mathematical addition. And I'm emphasizing these requirements because in the real world, none of those things are true, but we can still get something that is approximately Gaussian. Um, not necessarily that the distributions have to be identical, just that you can't have one or a few of them that are so big that they dominate all the others. So your random factors have to be about the same size. The tail of that distribution can't go too far off to the right. They can't be too strongly correlated with each other. Obviously, you can't have an infinite sample size in reality. It just has to be big enough. And you don't have to literally do addition. It just has to be mostly addition-like. So heuristically, we can say that when we're adding things up, they often converge to something that is at least approximately Gaussian. And I want to invoke the central limit corollary, or at least that's what I'm calling it, which is that if you multiply a bunch of random factors together, their product tends to be log normal. 
And one way to see why that's happening is that when we are multiplying those factors, we are also adding their logarithms. So if y is the product of x1, x2, x3, then the log of y will be the sum of the log of x1, the log of x2, the log of x3. So that suggests a model of why adult weight might have a log normal distribution. I'm going to run a simulation where I start with a random birth weight and then simulate the life of a person who at each time step gains or loses some percentage of their current weight. So we have to start with birth weights. And for that, I got data from the National Survey of Family Growth and fit a Gaussian model to the birth weights of the male and female babies in the data set, and they look pretty darn Gaussian. So our weights at birth follow a Gaussian distribution. But if we simulate this process where each year you don't gain one or two pounds, you gain or lose a percentage of your current weight. If you do that, then what you get are simulated weights that look very much like the data. So here I've got the data again with the orange and blue curves. The gray lines now are coming from simulations where again, I start with a Gaussian and then add or lose a percentage of current weight during each time step. And the result converges to a log normal distribution, which might explain why we are born Gaussian and we grow to be log normal. So that's the first mechanism, proportional gain, and that might explain the distribution of adult weight, but it's not clear how that explains running speed or chests or these other uh, attributes. I'm gonna start with running and I'm gonna grab some data. This is a 10K road race that I ran some number of years ago, turned out to be my personal best time of 42 minutes 44 seconds, so I just wanted to get that in there. But if we look at the other 500 people who ran this race and we plot the distribution of their speeds on a log scale, it looks very much like a log normal distribution. So why should running speed follow a log normal distribution? My theory is that everyone has a speed limit. No matter how hard you train, at some point you will converge to your speed limit and you probably won't get faster than that. And your speed limit is determined by many factors that interact multiplicatively. So there are probably physical factors like height and weight and muscle and aerobic capacity. There are probably psychological and circumstantial factors like whether you have the opportunity to train and the passion to do it and the competitiveness to reach the elite level. And I'm going to suggest that in order to be an elite world-class runner, you need all of these things. You need A and B and C. If any of them are bad, that will be your limiting factor. You will not be an elite runner. And that and operation is analogous with continuous factors with multiplication. So this is very much like we are taking all those factors and multiplying them together. And if we do that, we only need about five factors. If you sample five factors from a Gaussian and multiply them together, you can get a distribution that looks very much like the distribution of running speeds that we saw. Now, there are some parameters there that you tune in order to make the simulation fit the data, but the shape of these distributions is very similar. So proportional gain might explain the distribution of adult weight and this process, the weakest link process, that you are only as fast a runner as the factor that is the most rate limiting factor for you. If that weakest link explains running speeds, then the question is, what about other things like musical performance and chess, chess ability and things like that? So I got one more data set, which is ELO ratings from about 6 million players on chess.com. And ELO ratings are on a kind of arbitrary scale. So there's a free parameter here to slide this distribution left and right. 
But with a certain set of parameters, the distribution of these ELO ratings on a log scale is looking very much, again, like a log normal distribution. So is that proportional gain? Is that because of this weakest link process? I'm going to suggest it could be a combination of both, which is as you learn to do almost anything, you gain metacognition. You learn how to learn and you get exposed to better teachers and better opponents. You have richer opportunities to learn. So there's some proportional gain, but also limiting factors. If you lack an aptitude for that activity, or if you don't have the opportunity and resources to pursue it, or if you don't have the passion and persistence to keep at it, if you lack any of those things, you will not reach world class. So it could also be a weakest link kind of process. But the result of all of this, I propose, is that talent is Gaussian and lifelong achievement tends to be log normal. And that might explain this GOAT phenomenon, the fact that the greatest tends to be an outlier even among outliers, which we can see if we simulate, say, 10,000 or 100,000 people from a Gaussian and a log normal distribution, and I've tuned them to have the same mean and variance. So the difference between them is just the nature of the distribution. And we look at how far apart the top three performers are. What we see in the orange curve here, those orange crosses at the top, those are the top three people in a sample of 100,000. And they are clustered pretty close together because the tail of the Gaussian distribution just doesn't extend very far off to the right as contrasted with the log normal distribution that does have this very long tail. And as a result, the top three performers are pretty substantially different from each other. And the top rated chess player there, for example, would probably beat the number two player about nine times out of 10. So the Gaussian distribution has this short tail, which means that outliers are not very far apart. The log normal has this long tail where the greatest of all time can be much better than someone who is merely elite. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the methodology here because I've been asserting that this thing looks like it's Gaussian and that thing looks like it's log normal. I want to explain where that's coming from because for some of these measurements, one of them is clearly better than the other, but there are some others where that's not the case. So let's look a little bit more closely. I'm going to use one more data set, which is the anthropometric survey of U.S. Army personnel. It includes 93 physical measurements like height, weight, and arm length from about 4,000 uh, 4, male and about 2,000 female members of the U.S. Armed Forces. And we can go looking through those measurements to find which ones are best modeled by a Gaussian or a log normal. This is the example that turns out to be uh, the best Gaussian fit and the less good log normal fit. Male elbow rest height. Uh, doesn't matter very much what the measurement is, but you can see here that the gray area that shows the gap between the model and the data is almost invisible on the left and somewhat substantial on the right suggesting that the Gaussian model is better for this particular measurement. For weight, as we've already seen, the log normal distribution is substantially better. There's almost no visible gray area on the right. There's a substantial gap on the left between the best Gaussian model and the data. There are other cases like height where it turns out that both models are actually really good. So I said earlier that height is well modeled by a Gaussian, but it turns out that it is also just as well modeled by a log normal distribution. And finally, there are a few measurements like ear protrusion, how far your ear sticks out from the side of your head, that seem to be neither Gaussian nor log normal. Neither model fits the data very well. So I want to say where these parameters come from, because how we fit the model to the data is going to affect our, our 
our conclusion here and how we then compare the models to see which one is better. In general, when we're estimating parameters, there are a few different methods. Uh, the method of moments is to find the model that has the same mean, variance, or other um, moment-based statistics as the data. Maximum likelihood methods, which would choose the model that has the highest likelihood of producing the data. And percentile matching, which is kind of what we've been doing visually by comparing CDFs. And then to decide which model is better, we can compare CDFs. We could also uh, make a QQ plot, which is a similar way of comparing a distribution to a model. There are likelihood based methods uh, like information criteria, and then other statistics that are used to evaluate the goodness of fit between a model and the data. I'm going to suggest that because the thing we care about here is which model best captures the shape of the distribution, that the right metric to use and the right way to fit the parameters is to minimize the area between the curves, the area between the data and the model, and then use that area to decide which model has better captured the shape of the distribution. So this is the point where you might want to uh, look at the notebooks and see the details of what I'm doing. Again, the, the URL here, tinyurl.com, downy23goat, will get you these slides. And from there, you can get these links. The chapter four notebook is everything that was in chapter four of probably overthinking it. And then the methods notebook is what I'm talking about right now, which is the comparison between the log normal and Gaussian models. So a little bit of code to show you how this works. The way I'm going to compute these areas is first by computing equally spaced quantiles uh, over the range between the first and 99th percentile of the distribution. So here, I'm going to start with a series. That's my data set. I'm going to compute the first and 99th percentiles and then use Linspace to compute equally spaced points in that range, which you can see in the figure on the right as those vertical lines. Next, I'm going to take that series of data and compute an empirical CDF, which is the blue curve. I'm using a package here called empirical dist, which is a library that I wrote that I've used for several of my books. And it provides this CDF object that represents a cumulative distribution function. And you can call it like a function with parentheses in order to evaluate it at each of these quantiles. So again, that's what the vertical lines in the figure represent. That's the CDF evaluated at a range of quantiles. To evaluate the model, I'm going to use scipy.stats, which provides a norm object that represents a Gaussian distribution. And it provides this function, CDF, which evaluates the analytic distribution of, uh, of a Gaussian. And what this error function does is it evaluates the normal distribution, the model, at the set of quantiles, and then the CDF of the data at the same set of quantiles and it computes the differences between them. And the average of those differences is proportional to the area between these two curves. So on the right hand side, I've deliberately chosen a bad model so that we can see the space between them. And that's what that looks like. Finally, to minimize the area between the two curves, I'm using least squares from scipy.optimize, and I'm using it with the loss function soft1, which approximates the mean absolute error. It's not exactly the same, but mostly what I'm doing here is minimizing the area. And if we do that for both of the models and then make a scatter plot of that area between the curves, here's what we see which is in the lower left, cases where both models are good. In the upper right, the cases where both models are bad. The lower right means that the log normal model is better. And the upper left means that the Gaussian model is better. And often both of them are good, but 
When either of them is good, the log normal model is almost always as good or better. And then occasionally they're both bad. We see similar results with other kinds of measurements. So this is from blood test results like hemoglobin and white blood cell counts. In general, the log normal model is better, which contradicts the conventional wisdom. Usually we think of the Gaussian distribution as being ubiquitous. It's the default. It's, we assume it's Gaussian until proven otherwise. And the log normal distribution is a bit more exotic. You might not see it in an introductory stats class, I'm going to suggest that we subvert this Gaussian hegemony and start thinking of the log normal model as maybe being more pervasive than we give it credit for. So let me summarize. I think that there are these two mechanisms, proportional gain and weakest link, that might explain why log normal distributions are common. And that might explain why elite performers are outliers among outliers, and why the GOAT is the greatest of all time. If you went to the slides, you'll see some suggestions for further reading. I mentioned Malcolm Gladwell's book. I'll also mention Oliver Rader's book, which features Marion Tinsley, who was the greatest player of checkers, also known as drafts. Uh, he was possibly the greatest of all, greatest of all times. Um, I'll also point you to this paper that suggests this idea that many of the things that we think of as Gaussian might actually be better modeled as log normal. And finally, I'll suggest probably overthinking it. This is from chapter four, and there are uh, 11 more chapters that I think are just as interesting if you'd like to, to take a look at that. Also in the slides, I've mentioned some previous talks that I've given about other chapters in the book, but that's really just there so that you have those links for later use. I will stop there so that we have a couple of minutes for questions, and here are a few different ways that you can get in touch with me. So thank you. Great, Alan, thanks so much. Um, so yes, we do have uh, one question in the Q&A, which I will show here. Um, question, what processes would create distributions which are even more heavy-tailed compared to log normal distributions? Yeah, good question. So um, there are longer-tailed distributions, including the student T distribution when it's on a log scale and um, especially the power law distribution, the Pareto distributions. The same proportional gain model that I described here with a little bit of tweaking often yields very long tailed distributions. So one of the ways to get power law distributions is the rich get richer phenomenon. Um, and in fact, I will mention that chapter seven of probably overthinking talks about these, these mechanisms. The other one that I'll mention is the student T distribution. And um, on, a, on a long scale where that comes from is a mixture of Gaussians that have a range of different variances. So you, if you stack a bunch of Gaussians on top of each other, the high variance contribution to that mixture tends to pull that tail out into the extremes. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, so there are a couple of comments that I'll just if, see if there's something here that um, uh, Mustafa just made a comment during your talk, uh, but the data sets from the army is biased anyways, because there's a height link for so height limit for soldiers, isn't there? Is that uh, any thoughts? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. So the, the nice thing about that data set is that there are 93 different measurements of, you know, height and, and weight, but also, you know, arm length and ankle width and all sorts of funny things. So it's a useful data set because of the richness, but it is not a representative sample of, of the US and particularly in the extremes. So that's where I think the other data set, the uh, BRFSS is useful. It's a much larger data set. It's about 400,000 people. And it is very deliberately designed to be representative of the US population. <laughs> 